Chapter 2 The Gate of the Gods From time immemorial, man has felt himself to be confronted with evil supernatural beings. Amid such fears and wonders lived the river peoples of the Tigris and Euphrates, the legendary Sumerians, on broad plains, on terraces of temples and towers, the priests scanned the night sky, pondering over the riddle of the universe, the cause of all being, of life and death. By conjuration, by the burning of incense, by shouts and by whispers, by gesture and by song, the priests sought to attract the attention of the fickle gods. Spirit of the earth, remember. Spirit of the sky, remember. That the experience we are calling the phenomenon was known to ancient civilizations, just as it is to our own, is as much a fact of history as Kenneth Arnold's sighting in 1947 or well, the thousands of similar sightings that have taken place all over the world since then. To demonstrate this, and to get some idea of the earliest direct experience of the phenomenon in recorded history, it is necessary to go back to what is arguably the world's oldest known civilization, whose writing has come down to us and has been translated, the Sumerians. The Sumerians will give us some context for an understanding of how human beings have interacted with the phenomenon, when there was no internal or external censors to alter the reports, or confuse the issue with political agendas. That does not mean their accounts are reliable from the point of view of scientific inquiry. What they experienced was as difficult to describe for them as it remains for us. Yet, the consistency of their emotional and cultural response to the phenomenon, or to the memory of the phenomenon, which was handed down from earlier generations, gives us a stable platform from which to begin our investigation. Further, we will find out that there is enough similarity between the ancient Sumerian and Babylonian records on the one hand, and the biblical record on the other, that we can use the one to help understand the other. The pre-biblical accounts are a polytheistic version, and the biblical account is monotheistic. But they share many essentials, aside from their ideological differences. The importance of the Sumerian originals is that their legends give us the oldest written evidence of what we may call contact. The Two Worlds Interpretation one of the essential characteristics of the phenomenon is its otherworldly aspect. The phenomenon does not seem to originate in our world. This raises a question. What is our world? How do we determine what is part of it and what isn't? The answer may seem obvious. Whatever comes from the earth is part of our world. If something does not come from the earth, it must come from elsewhere, from another world. However, things are never that easy. The concept of world has changed considerably over the millennia since earliest recorded history. The world was whatever was known and discovered in the course of the rise and fall of civilizations. Alexander the Great was considered to have conquered most of the known world of his time, stopping only at the border of India even though there were vast territories, including the entire Western Hemisphere, that he did not know existed. The Roman Empire stretched from Palestine and Egypt to the British Isles. But that was nowhere near the whole planet. Old maps would show blank areas outside of whatever empire in which they were designed. The Western Hemisphere was not part of the world until it had been officially discovered in the 15th century CE, even though there had been expeditions to the eastern seaboard by the Norsemen before that, and even though the Clovis people and earlier migrations had traveled across the Bering Strait land bridge 
Africa, down into North and South America, long before there was an Egyptian dynasty or a ziggurat at war. Today, we believe we know the limits and boundaries of our world. But that confidence depends on an old paradigm that is largely geographic and spatial, and which does not take into account other dimensions of experience and of theories of modern physics that challenge our comfortable sense that we know our world and our position in it. In fact, the English word world is itself somewhat problematic. It has a Germanic origin and comes from two words, man and age. Thus, a world is an age of man. This gives the concept of world a decidedly anthropocentric spin, as well as focusing on the idea of age and thus of time. In Sanskrit, an age is a yuga, similar to the Gnostic concept of eon. The age we are living in now is called the Kali Yuga, the age of Kali, a time that is also a personification and a deification. For the Romance languages, the words mondo, mundo, munde, etc. derive from the Latin mundus, which means clean, neat, elegant and refined, as well as ornament. This is said to derive from the Greek cosmos, which means orderly. In other words, this understanding of world indicates order, neatness, even elegance. A world is something that has been designed perfectly, with associations of symmetry and even beauty. What then is the other world? If we are to go by the assumptions in the English and Romance language interpretations, the other world would be the domain of the non-human, the dirty, the messy. The age of man would become the age of non-man. It would be a time as well as a space, populated by beings of which we have no knowledge or recognition, something outside the symmetry of the beautiful world. Thus, the world is not the domain of everything the way we usually think it is. We may visualize a Venn diagram in which world is one circle and other world is another circle. When it comes to the phenomenon, the two circles overlap in a small area. That region is the domain of the phenomenon, called in Mesopotamia the Gate of the Gods, or Babylon. Now, this idea is predicated on the assumption that there are only two worlds, this one and another. That is by no means certain. There may be multiple worlds, not only multiple dimensions or multiple universes, but domains in which the physical laws that seem to apply in our world seem similar to ours, but modified or altered in some way. If this other world were entirely different, a parallel universe for instance, it might remain invisible or otherwise undetectable to ours forever, even as it impinges on our own. What we suggest is a world that is enough like ours that it provides some degree of reference. That is why the phenomenon appears to us to be almost real, almost contemporary, but not quite. What is another characteristic of the phenomenon? That it is visible. The visual sense is the first of the five classic senses, according to biologists and paleontologists, that appears during the process of the evolution of consciousness. The auditory, olfactory, and other senses involved in consciousness arrive somewhat later. The third characteristic is one normally associated with sightings of unidentified aerial vehicles. They seem to defy the laws of Newtonian physics, particularly where gravity is concerned. However, in addition to that obvious characteristic, there is another that should be mentioned. 
They appear as technology that is only slightly more advanced than anything humanity had devised up to the time of that sighting. As we will find out in Book 2, some of the more famous sightings in North America, the famous airship sightings of 1897, for instance, demonstrated technology or technological design that was perhaps 20 or 30 years at most beyond the capabilities of 1897 manned flight. There is thus a time factor involved in the phenomenon that is difficult to understand, but it exists. The visual information that is gathered during these sightings is the beginning of a kind of communication. It indicates an interface between the two worlds, one that will require a sophisticated definition of consciousness because it is the meeting place between two conscious beings that are otherwise dissimilar. Whatever is causing the phenomenon to exhibit these characteristics has stepped down its visual impact, so that it teases at the edge of our imagination. Imagination is the key concept here, for whatever caused the 1897 airship sightings did so by making an appearance that was almost credible to the level of technology of the general population at the time. They looked like flying boats, with various contraptions and appendages hanging off of them, whose function was mysterious. They were often silent, but could change direction suddenly without an obvious propulsion system. They were just advanced enough to cause wonder and astonishment, if they were gas-filled balloons, no one would have noticed, and it seems important that they be noticed. But not too much that they would be virtually invisible or beyond description. In other words, the phenomenon is not looking to be ineffable, just wonderful, fantastic, as in a manifestation of fantasy. It is as if we are being urged to dream a little more daringly to imagine the possibilities of which we are capable. They have baited a hook, which we imagine to be a worm, and we take the bait. In Sumer, a similar situation occurred. By going through their creation legends and some of the other otherworldly texts produced by the Sumerians, the Akkadians, and the Babylonians, and by examining their monuments and other architecture, we can determine that they were similarly affected by things seen in the sky. Their gods and cultural heroes went on journeys to the underworld and to the heavens. Their high priests met with incarnations of a goddess on the top of their ziggurats at certain times of the year, anticipating the contact between the high priest of the Israelites and their god once every year on Yom Kippur in the Holy of Holies and the Temple of Solomon. As stated before, the earliest civilization in the world with any kind of written documentation, the Sumerians, provide the template for much that will follow and will introduce us to the concept of two worlds and the phenomena that accompany them. And they will lead us to ask an important question one that may be at the heart of government secrecy concerning the phenomenon. Who's in charge? By the power invested in whom? Oddly, as long as the Earth was considered the center of creation, the authority held by human rulers was said to derive from the gods. Once the Sun was moved to the center, at least of our planetary system, then authority shifted from the gods to human beings, and rulership became anthropocentric. This seems somewhat counterintuitive. Just when we realized that we were not at the center of the universe, our science, philosophy, and culture began to insist that humans were more important than the gods. Religion became a quaint holdout against this anthropocentric point of view even as human beings themselves seemed less and less capable of running anything for any length of time without screwing it up. 
The Sumerians were deeply concerned with the issue of divine authority. The Sumerian rulers were believed to be in contact with the gods through the enactment of rituals which reinforced their authority in the eyes of their people even as they met the gods on specific days of the year. Each Sumerian city had its ruler, who was both secular leader as well as high priest of the Sumerian mysteries. Further, each Sumerian city was ruled by a different god. The center of religious worship was the ziggurat, a stepped pyramid, usually surrounded by a brick enclosure. There were chapels devoted to lesser gods, but at the very top of the ziggurat was a small chamber or temple of glazed brick. This was the Holy of Holies, where the god of the city would descend and meet with the city's ruler. In the case of Babylon, the ziggurat had seven levels, and the top chamber was of blue glazed brick, where Marduk would appear one day a year to a high priestess, designated for a ritual marriage. If Babylon was the gate of the gods, then this chamber of blue glazed brick at the top of the ziggurat at the center of the city was the point of tangents between the two worlds, the one small space on the planet where God and human met face to face. Various New Age authors have emphasized the importance of Sumer and its rituals, scriptures, and architecture to the ancient alien hypothesis. And there is an element of truth to these assertions, although it may not be obvious at once. While Zechariah Sitchin has written extensively about his beliefs that the Sumerian concept of the Anunnaki referred to alien technicians, most contemporary scholars of Sumer find no substance to these ideas, citing poor translations of Sumerian texts, as well as misinterpretations of Sumerian scriptures and conflation between Sumerian and later Babylonian texts. Sometimes, though, the most revealing evidence for non-human or non-terrestrial contact is hidden in plain sight. In this case, it can be found in the Babylonian creation epic, the Enoma Elish, and the story of Marduk himself. Most are familiar with the creation story as it appears in the book of Genesis. In that version, God creates the heavens and the earth, and eventually creates Adam, the first man, and Eve, the first woman. This story is told in different ways in the Bible, even within Genesis itself, and it is believed that this seeming inconsistency in the accounts is the result of two separate versions, the priestly version and the Yahwist version being included. That the creation story in Genesis is a reframing of the Mesopotamian original with a view towards presenting a monotheist interpretation as opposed to the prevailing polytheist version we find in most creation stories in the Middle East, is a subject of some debate among biblical scholars today. The biblical process of creating the universe and then the humans who inhabit the earth is a relatively benign one. There is no violence involved in Genesis 1, no struggle between opposing forces. In fact, in Genesis, God appears as a single uncreated entity with no consort or female companion. Yet he is anthropomorphic enough that he can walk through the Garden of Eden and speak with Adam. This is explained by saying that God created Adam in his own image and likeness. Thus, human beings are somehow reflections or versions of the divine original. The character or extent of this likeness is nowhere specified, however. Do humans look like God? Do they possess faculties similar or equivalent to those God possesses? We are only told that we share something in common with our Creator. Indeed, when God creates Adam from dust, He breathes life into him. This divine spirit 
may be the key to understanding how human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. It may be a way of explaining consciousness. The scholar Alan F. Siegel has written about the fact that for a long time, there was a tradition among the Jews of two powers in heaven. There was the invisible transcendental God that we know from the Bible, but also a kind of vice-regent of God, a visible, largely anthropomorphic entity that could walk and talk among the created humans. It was only much later that this belief was corrected and the idea of a vice-regent officially excised from Jewish theology as a heresy. In fact, it was still a common understanding during the time of Jesus, which is one reason why pious Jews could contemplate the idea that God could look and live like a human being and dwell among them. In this case, it is clear that image and likeness means just that. At the very least, Human beings are simulacrums of the divine original. In the Babylonian creation story, the Enuma Elish, there was a long protracted battle between various gods that finally results in the creation of human beings. This story pre-existed the biblical version by hundreds, if not a thousand years. It is now generally believed that the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, also known as the Torah, or the Books of Moses, was written or compiled in the 6th century BCE. The Enuma Elish has been dated to anywhere from 1000 BCE to 1800 BCE, at the earliest. In the Enuma Elish, divine powers existed in a primordial state, before the universe was created. Foremost among these was Apsu, and his spouse, Tiamat. Tiamat is described as a serpent or dragon deity, connected with the waters that pre-existed the land and the stars. Tiamat represented salt water, and her husband, Apsu or Abzu, represented sweet or fresh water. It was the commingling of these waters that gave rise to the generation of gods. As pointed out in several sources, Apsu and Tiamat are not gods per se, but seem to represent proto-deities, perhaps natural forces out of which the Sumerian pantheon was born. We know from Genesis, chapter 1, verse 2, that God is depicted as hovering or moving over the face of the waters. Thus, there is some general agreement between the two texts that water pre-existed the rest of creation. This sentiment is echoed in the Hebrew word for the deep, or the abyss, which is Tam, a word cognate with Tiamat. The similarity ends there, however. The Middle Eastern scriptural texts usually incorporate the motif of a chaos comp, or struggle against chaos that gives rise to water and the created universe. This struggle takes place between gods, with one set of deities winning at battle with another set. The Enuma Elish epic is no different, and may indeed represent the earliest recorded version of this type of narrative. But because the Bible is a monotheist text, there can be no chaos comp where creation is concerned. For well, that would indicate the presence of multiple deities and an ensuing struggle between them that would imply a certain degree of equality. In a monotheist context, there can be only one God, and that God must be all-powerful. Thus, there is no space for any kind of struggle. We may say that the biblical version of creation is a deliberate ideological challenge to the prevailing polytheist view and does not represent the method of creation, particularly the creation of human beings, as it was understood by most cultures of the ancient Middle East. However, there was no escaping several basic elements that are common to polytheism, and which hint at non-human actors, 
which have given scholars headaches, as we will find out. In the Enuma Elish, the younger gods, the children of Apsu and Tiamat, are noisy. They are creating enough disturbance that Apsu wants to destroy them. Apsu, however, is killed during his confrontation with the younger gods, and this angers Tiamat to the extent that she creates eleven hideous monsters to do battle with the other gods. The leader of the resistance against Tiamat is Marduk. Marduk is the god worshipped specifically at Babylon, dating from the period when Babylon was not as powerful as some of the other Sumerian cities, to the time when Babylon controlled much of Mesopotamia, making Marduk even more important. There is evidence for the existence of the worship of Marduk, called Amar Utu in Sumerian, or Calf of the Sun, as early as the 3rd millennium BCE, which is roughly the period of the earliest examples of Sumerian writing. The Sumerian people most likely settled in Mesopotamia around 4000 BCE or earlier, and it is considered likely that they migrated there from what is now Bahrain. It is not certain whether Amar Utu was a god they brought with them from Bahrain, or if he was a Sumerian version of a local Mesopotamian deity whose culture is now lost. He does, however, have associations with water, with astronomy in the calendar, and with magic. Marduk combined in himself elements we would find distributed among the gods of Egypt, for instance. He was part Thoth, Tahuti, part Horus, part Amun-Ra, and after his defeat of Tiamat in the great cosmic battle that gave birth to the cosmos, he became the ruler of the divine pantheon. He is sometimes said to have been born in the Apsu, the Abyss, indicating that he is a direct descendant of Apsu, the partner of Tiamat, and not actually born of the union of Apsu and Tiamat. He sometimes was considered the son of Enki, another deity associated with water, or an underground ocean, whose temple was known as E-Apsu, or House of the Abyss. Without delving too deeply into the Sumerian epic, it is enough to mention that Marduk became the hero of creation by defeating Tiamat, capturing her eleven monsters and her consort Kingu, who replaced her first husband, the slain Apsu, and slicing her body into halves, one for the heavens and one for the earth. He then sets the stars in their courses, and establish his order out of the chaos. What is often neglected in the popular telling of the Enuma Elish is the story of the Tablet of Destinies. This is the device that gives Marduk his authority over the other gods, the possession of which indicates his kingship. It is the mark of sovereignty, and according to the Enuma Elish, is worn as a breastplate. Its name Tablet of Destinies implies a divination or fortune-telling function as well. Marduk feels entitled to the tablet because Tiamat has given it to Kingu, whom she married upon the death of Apsu. Kingu is a weaker and somewhat a fit replacement for Apsu and does not seem to merit the authority that the tablet confers or recognizes. Marduk through sheer force of character, perhaps what sociologist Max Weber called charisma, after the Greek word for gift or grace, an inherent quality that is not earned, but which is intrinsic, and which may be related to the Sumerian concept of me, is depicted as being the rightful heir of the Tablet of Destinies. It is this idea of sovereignty and authority as deriving not from humans or human institutions, but from otherworldly sources that suggests trace evidence of contact. In this case, authority over human institutions is not conferred by humans themselves. The authority derives from elsewhere. Even Marduk, a god, 
does not automatically receive the Tablet of Destinies by right of birth or origin, but must win it by killing the holder of the Tablet, Kingu. A close reading of the Enuma Elish suggests that Tiamat committed a grave error by giving the Tablet to the grossly unworthy Kingu, a situation that contributed to her own defeat. There is another tradition concerning the Tablet of Destinies, that it was the sum total of human knowledge in written form, designed to withstand a deluge. Written in stone, so it would survive almost any environmental disaster of the time, it represented the continuity of information from the antediluvian to the postdiluvian period. Thus, it was wisdom, knowledge, and authority, a single device without which human civilization would not be able to jumpstart itself after the Flood. This idea of a written document that has been buried in order to survive a catastrophe is a very old one and found in many different cultures worldwide. There is the tradition of the Emerald Tablet of Hermes, a stone carved with the secret of the universe, buried in a cave in Egypt or under the sea found centuries later and resurrected from its hiding place. There is also the Tibetan tradition of the Terma, esoteric texts that were buried by teachers in ancient times and then rediscovered by those chosen by the gods. Even in 19th century America, this tradition is found in the story of Joseph Smith and the golden plates on which the Book of Mormon was written. Smith had performed a series of magical rituals in the woods of upstate New York, and eventually an angel, Moroni, directed him to the spot where the plates were buried. We are taking some time to look at this myth, even before we begin to discuss the creation of human beings by Marduk or Enki. In order to focus on the peculiarity of the idea of authority and sovereignty, and how it changed from a theocentric model to an anthropocentric model, and how that switch made it virtually impossible for human institutions to come to any kind of agreement on the nature of the phenomenon. One of the sources for this interpretation of authority is a 2008 paper co-authored by Alexander Wendt and Raymond Duvall entitled Sovereignty and the UFO. The abstract that begins the paper sets out the problem clearly by stating that modern sovereignty is anthropocentric, constituted and organized by reference to human beings alone, enabling modern states to command loyalty and resources from their subjects. However, it has limits, which are brought clearly into view by the authoritative taboo on taking UFOs seriously. The puzzle is explained by the functional imperatives of anthropocentric sovereignty, which cannot decide a UFO exception to anthropocentrism while preserving the ability to make such a decision. The UFO can be known only by not asking what it is. This is an important approach to the problem, for it sets out in language and concepts borrowed from modern philosophers Jacques Derrida Michel Foucault and Giorgio Agamben, the essential problem at the core of the UFO discussion, which is that our human institutions, having seized authority, essentially the Tablet of Destinies, from the gods, are now incapable of addressing the UFO issue. Since the phenomenon demonstrates superhuman characteristics that show it is not human-based or of human origin, our human institutions cannot say anything meaningful about it. The entire basis of human sovereignty is predicated on an anthropocentric view of the world, of reality. In other words, we will never have disclosure the way we understand it, because that would involve our human authorities acknowledging another, higher, potentially more powerful, authority in the world. Paradoxically, if our human authorities did acknowledge the existence of another authority, that would automatically undercut their ability to make such an acknowledgement. 
Catch-22. It was not always thus, however. Nevertheless, historically, sovereignty was less anthropocentric. For millennia, nature and the gods were thought to have causal powers and subjectivities that enabled them to share sovereignty with humans, if not exercise dominion outright. In modernity, God and nature are excluded. This is what gives us the fundamental problem. We cannot assign the phenomenon to the realm of religion, since we do not respect religion as a source of knowledge about the world. If we refer to our Venn diagram, we can say that science has pushed religion from this world to the other world. This world is the realm, now, of humans and of institutions, based on what the authors call a metaphysics of anthropocentrism, and is no longer the realm of the gods. Humans are sovereign, and human sovereigns rule over other humans. Anything that calls this into question is a threat to modern ideas of rulership and to the loyalty of human subjects to human rulers. Again, even though the Earth is no longer the center of the universe, the anthropocentric, the human-centric view of the world has replaced the theocentric, God-centric one. Humans are now the center of the universe, and scientists and governments the sole arbiters of what is real. The entire structure of modern societies depends on it. In fact, the very word real is cognate with royal. Reality is whatever the king says it is. This is why the phenomenon is unacceptable to both science and government. This is why there can be no such thing as a UFO. At least, that is why we are not able to define what it is. For well, that would automatically challenge the sovereignty of our institutions. It would shift the focus away from us to them. And we have no idea what the repercussions of that shift would be. For both science and the state, it seems, the UFO is not an object at all, but a non-object. Something not just unidentified, but unseen, and thus ignored. What of theocratic societies? Even though modernity has dominated the worldview of societies in the West, in the United States, Australia and Europe primarily, there are areas of the world that still emphasize the centrality of religion, such as regions in the Middle East, Asia and Africa, where economic development lags behind Western material achievements. It may be no coincidence that regions where economic development is slow are also regions where religious sentiments and a religious or spiritual worldview predominates. The association of matter with science, technology, and anthropocentrism is reflective of Gnostic ideas, of the corrupting influence of the material world. Yet even in these cases, there seems to be a reluctance to accept or acknowledge the reality of UFOs. Is it possible that to do so would be to challenge certain dogmas? In fact, we have evidence that even organized religion is willing to accept the idea of alien life. The Vatican recently came out with a statement that indicates a willingness to view the possibility of alien existence as not being at odds with Catholic belief. There has never been a problem with considering the possibility of alien life and alien contact in Islam, for instance, which generally has been more comfortable with science and scientific attitudes towards life on other worlds. Of course, this can be seen as a strategy to hedge one's bets, to maintain a degree of authority over the faithful by incorporating scientific and even pseudoscientific scenarios and thereby extending sovereignty over all forms of knowledge. In modern societies, however, the adherence to a scientific viewpoint, as if it were an ideology or a dogma, has effectively painted the skeptics into a corner. The omniscient God, 
has been replaced by the omniscience of science, and it cannot admit of knowledge that may be at odds with what is already known about the nature of the world and of reality. It cannot admit that the other world has any kind of objective existence. Instead, the other world is a trash receptacle for rejected knowledge. It is the domain of error, hallucinations, and the irrational. To be sure, the Sumerians and the Babylonians entertained a similar viewpoint. For them, the other world was the underworld, the realm of the dead, of evil spirits, of all the ills that pester humanity and tend to inject an element of chaos into order, and thus to challenge the supremacy of Marduk and the state. But to the Sumerians, the other world did exist. It was necessary to believe that it existed. Otherwise, there would be no need for divine authority. The existential threat posed by the other world, the source of danger and hostility, made rulership and social organization necessary. The Sumerians did not deal with the irrational or the chaotic by wishing it away. They understood that eternal vigilance was required. Life was replete with dangers, from environmental catastrophes to sickness to defeat and war. All of these dangers emanated from the other world, threatening to bring about a new chaos. Marduk can provide us with a template for rulership in Babylon. Marduk was clearly a supernatural being with divine origins, either directly from Apsu, as indicated in some texts, or from Enki, according to other texts, who fought against the hideous sea monsters created by Tiamat, as well as against Tiamat himself. Thus, he embodies both the very human attribute of a warrior as well as a spiritual force, whose battles took place before creation. By ordering the universe, he becomes a secular ruler as well, the ultimate authority over the reality he created. The kings of Babylon, Marduk's city, were also both sacred and secular rulers. It is important to point out that the division between sacred and secular did not exist as sharply in ancient Mesopotamia. A ruler was believed to possess authority over all realms of experience. Indeed, the word Babylon itself derives from a word of unknown origin, Babili, thought to mean gate of the gods. It was a liminal space between this world and the other world. In Hebrew, Wordplay on the name gave it a different etymology. Babo, meaning confusion, yet another ideological choice that can be said deliberately to characterize the religion of Babylon as a polytheistic confusion of gods as well as of tongues. Research has shown that the word Babylon often was extended to identify other cities in Mesopotamia, almost as if the word was a title rather than a geographic location, but with the original site as being of prime importance. According to Babylonian sources, Babylon was the first city that Marduk created, and for that reason alone, it could be considered a gate of the gods. The authority of Marduk extended from the temple enclosure at the top of the ziggurat, the point of tangents between this world and the other world, down the seven levels to the surface of the earth, and from there to the seven descending levels of the underworld. Some of this was retained in the Jewish tradition. The Tablet of Destinies became the breastplate of Aaron, with its associated Urim and Tumim, a divination system that is the subject of some academic discussion and controversy but which seems to have been a simple method of casting lots or dice. The temple enclosure at the top of the ziggurat became the Holy of Holies of Solomon's temple. The New Year ritual of face-to-face -face contact with Marduk became the Yom Kippur ritual. 
during which the high priest was permitted to enter the Holy of Holies. Much of Genesis is an elaboration or rendition of material that has been found in the Sumerian and Babylonian texts. The Great Flood, Noah and his Ark, even the idea that the kings who lived before the Flood enjoyed enormous longevity, are all prefigured in Sumerian literature and belief. So too the famous Tower of Babel, which is an obvious reference to the ziggurat at Babylon. According to Genesis, chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, this tower was built on the plain of Shinar. Shinar is the Hebrew word for Sumer. The tower itself was intended to reach the heavens and so make a name for the people of Babylon. According to Genesis, chapter 11, verse 5, the Lord came down and saw what the Babylonians were doing, complaining that nothing they planned to do will be impossible for them. For that reason alone, according to Genesis, God confused their language so that they would not be able to cooperate. He made the people of the earth divided so that they would not compete with him. That's it. That is the entire story. There is no mention of God punishing the Babylonians because of the sin of pride or anything else, as this story has often been interpreted in Sunday school and Catholic confraternity classes. The only problem God had with the builders of the tower is that they were able to do whatever they set their minds to do, and God could not allow that. So he came down a phrase that could be interpreted to mean descended, as from the sky, or simply that he showed up in some fashion. In either case, he seems to have been absent during most of the construction of the tower, and only arrived when it seemed they were succeeding in their efforts. This continual absence of God from the earth in Genesis is notable. The God of the Torah appears, issues edicts, then disappears. He reappears at moments when humanity seems on the brink of some major breakthrough, and then stymies it. What we have here is an iteration of Genesis 3, where God has created two human beings, told them what to do and what not to do, and then disappears. Eve is told by the serpent in the garden that if she eats of the forbidden fruit, she shall be like God, knowing both good and evil. God reappears and learns of the disobedience of his creations, which is really their desire to become the equal of God. God cannot tolerate that and removes them from the field of operation, the Garden of Eden, where their newly acquired knowledge would enable them to compete with him. And when the Babylonians demonstrate their capabilities by building a tower, God once again intervenes to keep human beings from attaining divine status. Human beings in the Bible have slave status vis-a-vis -vis God. And it can be argued that this is an inheritance from Sumerian beliefs. In Genesis, humans have the power to do what they want but they do not have the authority to do what they want. The authority is God's alone. The biblical version represents a monotheistic authority, and the Enuma Elish, among other Sumerian, Akkadian, and Babylonian epics, represents a polytheistic authority, but in essence, they are identical. For all practical intents and purposes, authority whether in a monotheistic or polytheistic context, remains the most important attribute of a god. Any human authority must derive from that divine authority. It must be bestowed by a god upon a human, and can be taken away as quickly as it was given. Thus, too, the phenomenon represents a challenge to human anthropocentric authority. The sight of a vessel flying through the air would not be ignored or ridiculed in a society where authority emanates from a divine source. 
The paranormal in general is consistent with religious documents, rituals, beliefs, and experiences. One of the reasons it is ridiculed by science, guilt by association, visions, dreams, apparitions, and supernatural phenomena create a space for the experience of the UFO. In a modern society, however, where a constantly evolving scientific paradigm determines the contours of reality, these phenomena are judged to be non-existent. They lack reality. They are not real in any kind of scientific sense, and thus there is no need and no attempt to explain them, analyze them, critique them, because to do so would be to undercut the very foundational model of science. They do not represent phenomena that can be tested, predicted, or measured, even though they are known to leave physical traces. Theories of UFOs are not, in scientific parlance, falsifiable. In a modern society, where a dominant political model of human rulership demands loyalty and obedience from humans to humans, these phenomena are ignored. To do otherwise would be to undermine the very foundational model of human sovereignty. As we are told in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, Witchcraft, the domain of antinomian religious practice and belief, is the equivalent of rebellion against the state, one that obtained in ancient Sumer as it did in ancient Palestine and it holds to this day. As there was no science, as a recognized discipline separate from a religious or spiritual context in those days, then methods of science that were not part or supportive of the prevailing attitude also would be considered witchcraft and treasonous, vide Galileo. Ironically, the only way any of this makes any sense at all is if we remember the near-universal understanding that all authority ultimately derives from the fact that human beings are not autonomous. They are not self-creating, but merely self-replicating, like von Neumann's Universal Constructor. More about this later in Book 3. Humans are a product of something else, some other factor, that the ancient sources tell us were the gods. One Million Years a Slave About two million years ago, we saw the evolution of the first humans from their primate ancestors. This was Homo habilis, or handyman, possibly the first tool-making primate ancestor, and is the subject of some controversy, since not everyone agrees that this species was a hominid. Then, about one million years ago, Homo erectus, upright man, made its appearance. Its origins are equally controversial, with some paleontologists suggesting that Homo erectus arose first in Africa and then spread to parts of Europe, Central Asia, China, and Indonesia, with other experts suggesting that Asia was the point of origin. It has even been proposed that some of the earlier extinct hominid species, such as Homo habilis, should properly be classified under the Homo erectus category. Eventually, however, Homo neanderthalensis made its appearance. Earliest forms seem to date to about 500,000 years ago, with the fully formed Neanderthals only about 250,000 years ago and then became extinct about 40,000 years ago. Homo sapiens, of which we humans are a subspecies, known as Homo sapiens sapiens, arose about 200,000 years ago and coexisted for a time with the Neanderthals until the latter became extinct. We share an almost identical genetic heritage with Neanderthals with only about a 0.12% difference between us. According to genetic and paleontological evidence, therefore, 
The origins of humanity are broadly, if somewhat incompletely known. We can trace our lineage back two million years, at the most liberal guess, to one million years, the conservative estimate, and time. At the very latest, we can use the 200,000 to 250,000 year estimate of the appearance of both the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens as our point of origin. It really depends on what one means by the term human, and especially modern human. There are questions of genetics, of course. There are also questions of consciousness. Did a larger brain size indicate greater intelligence? And did greater intelligence contribute to the development of consciousness? These are still controversial issues today, especially as it has become obvious that not everyone agrees on the definition of terms like intelligence and consciousness. If we do not know how to define consciousness, then we are unable to determine when it first developed. We are not even confident enough to state unequivocally that animals have consciousness. We are certainly nowhere near accepting that plants have consciousness, much less the elements themselves that make up human beings, animals and plants. As we will find out in a later chapter, the genetic origins of consciousness are now being hotly debated. Without going into that controversy in detail, we can ask a few basic questions here, since they go to the problem of the origin of human beings. And this problem relates directly to the question of the phenomenon itself. First of all, let us assume that the nature of humanity and of human beings presupposes the existence of consciousness. We feel we are different from every other creature on Earth because of our consciousness. We are introspective beings who wonder about things like life, death, the afterlife, etc. And we do not perceive the same concerns taking place among other members of the animal kingdom or the plant kingdom. We also seek to control our environment in ways that no other species, genus, family, etc. is done. We build cities, cars, rocket ships. We design intelligent networks, create fiber optic cables and irrigation systems. We do not see other species doing the same. Ergo, we believe it is our consciousness that sets us apart from the rest of creation. We calculate, measure, manufacture. We create works of art, music, and literature. We do not see the same activity elsewhere among other creatures. Yet everything that lives has genetic material. There is now a growing body of evidence to suggest that the genetic code originated elsewhere than on our planet, and that it was somehow seeded onto the Earth, either accidentally, due to a meteor strike, or some other natural mechanism, or deliberately, this begs the question, is life the same as consciousness? Again, we do not agree on definitions of either of these terms, so it becomes an exercise in pure speculation to come down on one side or another of this discussion. Instead, let us look for an answer, or at least trace evidence, in the historical record. The Enuma Elish tells us that humans were created from the blood of the slain Kingu. Remember that Kingu was appointed by Tiamat to be commander of the forces fighting Marduk, and he was also the god to whom Tiamat gave the Tablet of Destinies. Thus, Kingu represents the enemy of Marduk, and it is from Kingu's blood that humanity is formed. Humanity, therefore, traces its origins to a weak, illegitimate, and defeated spiritual force. The purpose behind our creation was to work as slaves for the gods, who are therefore relieved of any hard labor, and who are thus assured of a continuous supply of food and drink. 
This is exactly as it was stated in the ancient Sumerian and Babylonian texts. The elaborate theories of Zechariah Sitchin and others, that humans were developed to engage in mining operations, etc., simply are not necessary in order to make the point that the Sumerians believed that humans were created to work for the gods. It's an unnecessary complication for which there is tenuous, at best, evidence. The cosmos itself was created from the body of Tiamat. Her bones, blood, and organs were used in various ways to complete the organization of the external world. The blood of her consort Kingu was used to create human beings. Thus, humans are not of the same genetic line as the rest of the universe, although their origin is due to divine energy, the will of Marduk, and divine substance, the blood of Kingu. It should be noted that the god who actually does the work of creating humans, once told to do so by Marduk, is the Sumerian god Enki. Enki was the lord of fresh water, of artifice, magic, and the ability to manipulate matter. His temple was known as the E Abzu, with its clear reference to the Abzu, or Abyss. In other versions of the creation story, Enki takes a more central role in the creation of human beings, but always winds up using the blood of another god. In one case, using clay mixed with blood, and always for the purpose of using human beings as slave labor. Eventually, however, the slaves revolt. When that happens, the gods decide to wipe them off the face of the earth with a great flood. Deluge stories and legends are known virtually worldwide, and that may be due to the memory of a single flood that took place in the distant past or, more likely, refers to various floods occurring in different parts of the world at different times. Many people living today have had experience of floods. They are a relatively common occurrence. So there is no need to look for a single cataclysmic event that affected the entire globe. What is a common denominator between the Babylonian account and that in Genesis, however, is that both floods are the result of the gods or God becoming angry with human beings. In other words, humans brought the flood upon themselves. The other common denominator is the idea of a special human who is spared, along with his family. This story may be taken two different ways. In the first place, we may be seeing an ancient attempt to describe natural selection. This is the essential theme of Darwinism which states that some species die out and others survive due to their inability or ability respectively to adapt to environmental forces. When some humans survive a catastrophe, a cataclysmic event like a tsunami or other natural disaster, we may describe them and their offspring as having been the product of natural selection. Of course, this is not exactly true. In Darwinian terms, this process takes place over long periods of time and is not the result of a single event taking place over weeks or even months, but rather adaptations and mutations of the species that survive under hostile conditions or develop as strategies appropriate to their particular environment. It may be that what the authors of Genesis were describing was a memory of other hominids becoming extinct, leaving only Homo sapiens sapiens alive to tell the tale. The other way of interpreting these stories is to suggest that the selection was not natural at all, but deliberate. In fact, in Genesis, God specifically tells Noah to build the ark. Once again, authority comes from a divine source, the power to build the ark, however, is human. Humans, after all, are still slave labor, even as late as Genesis chapter 6. Before that happens, however, there is a bit of stage setting. One of the prominent theories of Sitchin and others, both before and after him, 
concerns an enigmatic reference in Genesis chapter 6, which is the chapter of the Bible dealing with Noah and the flood. It opens with a reference to the sons of God and the daughters of men, and then on to the Nephilim. This is one of those areas that has been exploited by Sitchin, von Daniken, and others, who have promoted the ancient alien theory, because it is one of the strangest episodes of the Bible. It is actually one of the places in the Bible that could be used to support an ancient alien theory, if it hadn't been misinterpreted by Sitchin and others, who went overboard in their zeal to prove their own ideas. Sitchin, about gold mining operations, the Anunnaki, and a twelfth planet, and von Daniken, with his insistence that the sons of God were aliens engaged in artificial insemination of human beings. If we separate these fanciful notions from the texts themselves, we can see that there are grounds for supposing that this small section of the Bible, barely a paragraph, gives us the best indication yet that something truly weird took place in dim prehistory and that the memory of it was fresh enough or traumatic enough that civilizations around the world retained some elements of it in their creation epics. There were giants in those days. The New International Version of the King James Bible begins Genesis chapter 6 this way. When men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. There are a great many mysteries tied up in these few lines. Who were the sons of God? Who were the Nephilim? What is the meaning behind all the non-sequiturs in these two paragraphs? Why does God interject his statement about his spirit not contending with man forever between the two descriptions of the sons of God and the daughters of men? And if the children of their union gave rise to heroes of old, men of renown, if we are supposed to read the sequence that way? then why does the author of Genesis complain that men were wicked in the paragraph that follows? The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind, whom I have created, from the face of the earth. Obviously, we're missing something. The sons of God were supposed by many commentators to mean angels or some type of supernatural being. Later research indicates that the term son of God was used to refer not to angels, but to a kind of royalty, to kings or to high-ranking ministers. That indicates a social disconnect between men and sons of God. The opening sentence says that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. Thus, the sons of God were not men in any kind of normal sense, but they had bodies that functioned as those of humans. The Hebrew term used in Genesis chapter 6 is Bene Elohim, it is a term that has been used in different ways to mean slightly different things. David Pinchansky, a professor of theology, writes that Bene Elohim refers to a divine council, a group of beings who serve as ministers to God. They either have human bodies or can assume human bodies in order to function on the earth. 
When they do assume human bodies, it seems that they are able to propagate through sexual intercourse with human women. The Bene Elohim are exclusively male, as the account of Genesis chapter 6 suggests, and produce offspring from this union. In common UFO parlance, these might be considered hybrids. Enter the Nephilim. Sitchin wants to translate this word as fallen, meaning fallen angels, after the Hebrew word nafel. That was a popular interpretation among biblical scholars for a while, but it since has been demonstrated to be faulty and not consistent with rules of Hebrew grammar. It was actually a loan word from Aramaic, nephilia, that had been Hebraized and given its plural form nephilim. For some reason, the translators of the King James Bible kept the word nephilim in their version without translating it themselves. There was confusion, or perhaps astonishment, over the real meaning of nephilim, which is probably what kept it in a transliterated form. Nephilim, according to scholars of Hebrew and Aramaic, can only mean one thing. Giants. This was not a word used in a general sense, metaphorically referring to someone of great personal stature or charm. The word refers specifically to beings of extraordinary size. Genesis tells us the Nephilim were around in those days and afterwards, the implication being after the flood. The further implication is that they are no longer around, well, they were only around in those days, and also afterward, but evidently not now. It may be the Nephilim who are described as men of renown. There is also the repetition of the phrase, on the earth. It appears four times in those six verses. Not to be coy, but where else would man be but on the earth? Were there men elsewhere in creation? Was it only those on the earth who had become troublesome in the eyes of their creator? Otherwise, why was the repetition, a form of emphasis, necessary? And where did the Nephilim, the giants, come from? One reading, the most commonly accepted, links the offspring of the sons of God with the daughters of men with the Nephilim. In other words, when the two mated, these monstrous forms were created. That would indicate that the sons of God were not part of the same gene pool as the men and the daughters of men. In other words, the kings of the earth, the Bene Elohim, the royalty, those holding an authority from God, were not human themselves. The human men were the slave race, as indicated before. Their daughters were part of that same race, obviously. The mating of the daughters with the Bene Elohim produced giants, genetic abnormalities. Briefly, we considered whether what was being described was some kind of Neanderthal. Were the Nephilim, or their progenitors, Neanderthals? Unfortunately, for many reasons, that can't be true. For one thing, the Neanderthals were considerably shorter than Homo sapiens sapiens. They may have appeared more brutish, perhaps, but they were a good head or more shorter than their hominid siblings, definitely not giants. Is there some clarification to be found in the earlier Babylonian sources? Fortunately, there is. One of the most famous personalities from Babylonian literature is Gilgamesh the hero of the Gilgamesh epic, and intimately associated with the Babylonian flood stories. In order to fully understand the idea of the Nephilim then, we have to go back to earlier non-Jewish sources that had a more finely articulated history of this period and that helped to clarify matters even as they present a startling alternative view. This includes the Gilgamesh material and those ideas associated with it, including the Apgalu or Abgal. 
The Abkalu, to use the Babylonian term, Abgal, to use the Sumerian, were seven wise beings, seven sages, who existed before and after the flood. They were responsible for teaching the newly created human beings the benefits of civilization. These were not humans, but divine or quasi-divine beings, who could assume human form when necessary or desired. In other words, they were the template for the biblical idea of the Bene Elohim. The most controversial version of the story of the Apkalu comes from Barassus, who was a priest of Bel Marduk in the 3rd century BCE. According to his account, one of the Apkalu, named by him Owens, would give rise from the sea, presumably the Persian Gulf, each morning and teach the people what they needed to know about agriculture, astronomy, etc., and then would return to the sea at dusk. He would not eat or drink anything on land, and he dressed in an unusual suit that resembled a fish with scales. He wore a head covering, which looked like the head of a fish, and his clothing resembled that of a fish, except for the fact that he walked on two feet. Eventually, other Apkalu followed the first, and they would remain in contact with the human beings for some time, at least up to the flood. They were said to have their origins in the Abzu, the Abyss of Enki, and they were sent back there when they had angered Marduk, who viewed them as having corrupted the human race. This, however, did not take place before the Apkalu began to mate with the human women had produced offspring that were part human, part Apkalu. These elements, taken from a variety of Sumerian and Babylonian sources, clearly anticipate Genesis chapter 6. If biblical scholars such as Michael Heiser and David Penchansky are correct, then there is a strong Mesopotamian tradition of a council of normally invisible beings, the Apkalu, the Abgal, or the Beni Elohim, who appeared on earth as advisors to the human race, and who eventually mated with human women, creating monstrous offspring in the process. The biblical account is clearly a somewhat sanitized version of the Mesopotamian original, given a monotheistic spin. If we subtract the ideological changes from the story, we can determine that a very strong indication of a general belief that there was a non-human contact with humans at some point in prehistory. This non-human contact is not merely a euphemism for God or angels, because the words that are used for these terms in the Bible, El, Elohim, Yehovah, Malachim, etc., are quite different from those used to characterize the Apkalu. Bene Elohim. These were beings of an order quite different from humans. Normally invisible, they would assume human form to interact with human beings, and even produce offspring from sexual intercourse with human women. Gilgamesh was one of these. According to what is generally known as the Epic of Gilgamesh, in reality, a collection of cuneiform tablets containing narratives about the hero, Gilgamesh, is two-thirds divine and one-third human. He obtained knowledge of the world from before the flood by speaking with the Babylonian version of Noah and learning how he became immortal. Now largely believed to have been a historical figure, circa 2600 BCE, Gilgamesh has entered the realm of supernatural legend long before his presumed reign. He had rejected the advances of the goddess Inanna, for instance, and fought the demon Humwawa. In one of the tablets containing the Epic of Gilgamesh, found in the ancient city of Ugarit, Ras Shamra, we learn that Gilgamesh is a giant. He is described as being eleven cubits tall, and four cubits wide. If each cubit is about 20 inches long, 11 cubits would mean Gilgamesh was 220 inches, 
or about 18 feet tall and 80 inches or 6 feet wide. His being a giant and two-thirds divine and one-third human would make him one of the Nephilim. The king of Uruk, Gilgamesh was as much a culture hero as a godling. We may say of him that he was a man of renown. He certainly was a warrior. But his most famous exploits are those involving supernatural beings, such as the demon Homwawa, whose face is usually portrayed as a mass of entrails. In fact, the name of Gilgamesh in cuneiform is often preceded by the Dinger symbol, which is usually reserved as the identifier of a god. He is someone who straddles the line between Apkulu and human, a being who was conceived of a human woman, but whose paternity remained a mystery. In fact, according to the single legend concerning his birth, his mother, surrounded by armed guards to ensure that she would not be molested and lose her virginity illegitimately, became pregnant with him, even as she was under lock and key. Alarmed, the guards took the baby and threw him from the top of a tower to be dashed on the rocks below. But an eagle arrived just in time and settled the baby Gilgamesh safely onto the earth. Thus, without addressing it in so many words, the origin of Gilgamesh is that of a daughter of men and a supernatural father, an Apkalu. And he developed into a giant who was two-thirds divine. This is in keeping with the biblical tradition, as well as the Mesopotamian one. In fact, according to the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Apkalu designed and built the walls of his city, Uruk, the Apkalu themselves are often depicted as having human bodies, but the heads of birds, similar to the type of iconography we find in Egyptian illustrations of Thoth, Horus, etc. Mesopotamian bas-reliefs depict them as a type of griffin with four wings, as well as bird heads, indicating their capability of flight. In fact, it is probably these huge reliefs that were found in Babylon and elsewhere that gave rise to the famous vision of Ezekiel I, a favorite of ancient alien theorists, in which the cherubim make their appearance as having four wings and four faces, those of a man, an eagle, an ox, and a lion. As Ezekiel I had this vision in Babylon, it could be said that the local artwork influenced its content. A further connection of Gilgamesh to the Flood story that starts with the discussion of the Sons of God and the Nephilim is his visit to Utanapishtim, Sumerian Ziusudra, the Babylonian Noah. It was from this personality that Gilgamesh learned of the ways of the world before the Flood or Utanapishtim survived the deluge in an ark with his family, plants, and small animals. Utanapishtim had saved the seed of humanity, and for this was rewarded by the gods with immortality. There is no space to go into this story in full, but it is mentioned to show that Genesis chapter 6 has its origins in Babylonian religion, which itself at its origins in Sumer. To summarize the data, the universe was created as a result of a struggle between invisible forces, characterized as fresh water and salt water, which gave birth to gods who turned on their parents and used the body of one to create reality and the blood of another to create humanity. Thus, humans are a product of one of the defeated gods. In some versions of this narrative, clay from the earth is used as a medium, mixed with divine blood. The purpose of the creation of human beings was as slave labor for the gods. Also present in the heavens were intermediary forces, a kind of assembly or council known as the Apkalu in Babylon 
the Abgal and Sumer, and the Bene Elohim among the Jews, who were in charge of the situation on earth. These beings were able to assume human form, but were not human beings. They copulated with human women. There does not seem to have been female Apgalu to mate with human men. And the result of their intercourse was a generation of Nephilim, or giants. For reasons which are not entirely clear, God, or the gods, decided to destroy the human race by sending a flood. However, they decided that some genetic material could be salvaged, and that resulted in the stories of Noah in the Bible and Udenapishtim in Babylonia. At some point after the flood, the gods, or their emissaries, the Apgalu, Abgal, Beni Elohim, disappeared. Suddenly, human beings were on their own again. The loss of contact with these supernatural beings was lamented in the Sumerian hymns and incantations. Rituals evolved to bring them back, at least temporarily, using sacrifices and sacred marriages. The sacrifices recall the blood that was used to manufacture human beings, acknowledging that our blood is not really ours, but theirs. The sacred marriages recall the sons of God meeting with the daughters of men. Using these two mechanisms, we were reminding the Apgalu of this ancient Ur event in human history, reenacting over and over, through thousands of years, that initial trauma. Or perhaps we have been working through that trauma ourselves, using ritual to try to understand what had happened and what our purpose is on this planet. These stories were well known throughout the Levant as late as the 1st and 2nd centuries CE. They were inextricable elements of the culture going back thousands of years. There are New Testament references to these same Bene Elohim and to the seven sages, the Apkalu, who were punished for having intercourse with human women and producing their hybrid offspring. They are not called Apkalu in the New Testament, of course, but are cited in 2 Peter and Jude as angels who sinned and who were imprisoned in Tartarus, in the Septuagint Greek, usually just translated as hell in English translations, or in deep gloom. Tartarus, of course, is the underworld abyss of Greek mythology and the place where the Titans, who themselves sinned against the older gods and were overthrown, were imprisoned. This idea of a war in the heavens, which led to the creation of the world and of human beings from divine substances, is familiar throughout the West. Roman and Greek mythology abound in examples, and the same theme would find itself represented in the Abrahamic literature as well. Like the stories about a great flood, these myths reflect knowledge of, or experience of, an actual event or events. The idea that human beings were created as slaves or playthings of the gods also is present everywhere we look. And the high strangeness element, that some type of being with a supernatural origin mated with human women in the distant past to create hybrid offspring, is also very familiar to Sumerians, Akkadians, Babylonians, and Jews, not to mention Romans and Greeks. The figure of Prometheus in Greek mythology shares many elements in common with the Near Eastern narratives. He is regarded as the divine being, actually one of the Titans, who brought wisdom, arts, and learning to human beings and who stood up for humans in opposition to Zeus and was punished for it. Prometheus most famously stole fire from the gods and gave it to humanity. He was then chained to a rock for eternity, having his liver eaten every day by an eagle only to have it grow back at night until he was rescued by Hercules. In his anger, Zeus fashioned Pandora, 
the first woman, out of clay, and sent her to live with men as a punishment. These various motifs are viewed by scholars as iterations of the Mesopotamian originals 